The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Bruce Momjan. Um, multi-version concurrency control and he is the co-founder of the Postgres SQL Global Development Group. Uh, everyone welcome, Bruce. Okay, thank you. Hey. Um, if you guys want to move ahead, if you can't see, feel free. I'm not going to be up on the podium. I'm going to be down here. Um, and the reason is because if I'm up on the podium, I can't point at the slides and I cannot give this presentation without pointing at the slides because it will be just impossible to understand, I'm afraid. So um, feel free to move up if you need to. You don't have to. But anyway, I can't stand up there because of the way the, the, this slide thing is so forward. The, the thing. All right. Um, so yeah, my name is Bruce Momjin. I work for Enterprise DB. Uh, one of the Postgres tour team members. Been working with Postgres since 1996. Uh, I am giving this talk. Obviously, right now, I have a talk tomorrow after the keynote, 11, 15, 10, 15, I believe, about home automation. I'll be giving a talk uh, of some unknown nature on Sunday because we have a, an SQL sort of unconference here at the, at the same uh, venue at the Blake Hotel. And then on Monday, I will actually be giving uh, a full day training class in Postgres. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your uh, Sunday schedule, you'll see a little URL that talks about the conference. If you go to my website, there's also a link to the training on Monday as well. Um, this slide deck, along with about 30 other slide decks, are available in PDF format at that website. Uh, that is my home page. It has my blog, has all the conferences I attend, has a you know sort of contact information, stuff like that. Feel free to look through the presentations. There's a lot more stuff than just this up there, obviously. Uh, there's also recordings of a lot of my presentations on that website as well. So it is really kind of a treasure trove of information. Um, all these uh, presentations are Creative Commons attribution licensed. I do have people who do use these presentations um, uh, to give at other conferences and for other trainings for customers. Uh, it prevents me from having to go to all these places. So uh, it does make my life a little easier. Uh, any questions before we get started? Again, this is um, somebody asked me how hard is this going to be. It's not going to be like you have to know a huge amount about Postgres, but you have to be willing to learn about Postgres and be willing to kind of stretch your mind. I gave this talk about uh, two years ago in Europe. Uh, I had to do it also in an hour, and somebody said it was like a wild roller coaster ride. So be prepared for something that's going to be kind of challenging. Um, it, you're going to have to think about it. A lot of people have said they've attended the this session, this presentation, multiple times. They said the second and third time kind of really gelled it for them. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what we're actually going to be talking about. This slide deck is actually a little heavy on text. I will obviously not be reading all the text on these slides, but the text is there. So if at some point you want to look at it later, you can go to that URL, look through the slides again, and kind of refresh yourself. I will be taking questions during the session. Um, I do apologize to the person who has to move the microphone around to do that, but I will be repeating your question, so hopefully we can uh, do a quick you know, question answer as we go, because it is very easy to get confused with this stuff. Yes? Is that a question? No. OK. Um, let's start it off. Unmasked. What does unmasked mean? Who are these people? I actually saw this picture in a restaurant today in Charlotte for when I went out to lunch. It was in the men's room. Name, a hotel, name of the restaurant? Uh, it was a restaurant in the epicenter, if you've ever been there. Um, who are these people? Why is it important? Uh, what does unmasking mean? This is one of the odd pictures because you know all of these actors, but you only probably recognize three of the faces. Uh, it turns out that they are the original Star Wars cast. And uh, what's interesting is that they all, th three of the six people, were masks in the presentation. 
I mean, I'm sorry, wore masks in the, in the film so you don't recognize them. Of course, Chewbacca being the tall one, next to him Darth Vader, and then R2-D2 down at the bottom there. Um, so why is it important to understand something that's, that's, what does unmasking mean? It basically means that you're now seeing something that you didn't see before, and I think by understanding what that unmasking, by going through that unmasking process, you get a deeper understanding of exactly how something's made, how something's done, how a movie's made, and so forth. Okay, so uh, why is it important to understand um, MVCC? Uh, MVCC obviously means multi-version concurrency control. We say that a mouthful a lot um, when we work with Postgres. I'm gonna be explaining what it is in a minute. Why is it important to understand this MVCC thing? It helps you to predict query behavior. It helps you to better manage uh, performance effects and it helps you understand uh, space reusage. Okay, so uh, what are we gonna talk about today in the next hour? Introduction, I'm gonna talk about what MVCC is. Um, again, that's pretty simplistic. Then I'm gonna talk about the implementation details of MVCC and then finally I'm gonna talk about cleanup uh, because there are some cleanup aspects of MVCC uh, that do affect uh, basically how MVCC works, okay? So let's get started. MVCC, what is it? Multi-version concurrency control. Uh, allows Postgres to offer high concurrency even during significant database read-write activity. Many of you may know Postgres has a reputation for being uh, very uh, performant when there's a lot of concurrent activity going on in, in the system. Uh, obviously, that's one of the very important aspects of uh, database systems is the ability to handle high concurrency uh, while all everyone's sort of running at the same records or reading and writing at the same time. That's really what MVCC does. Um, probably the big moniker for MVCC is that readers never block writers and writers never block readers. Um, that seems impossible, but in fact, I'm going to explain why it is not, you know, why it is possible in Postgres. Um, you have to kind of leave the traditional locking uh, assumptions that you made with older systems. Older database systems pre-MVCC had one copy of a record. If somebody changed it, nobody could really read it while it was being modified. That assumption is really washed away with MVCC, and that's really, I think, the big takeaway in terms of understanding why Postgres does so well in a multi-concurrency environment. Okay, uh, what database systems support MVCC? Uh, Postgres, of course, Oracle does. DB2 has a partial implementation. Uh, InnoDB, part of MySQL, uh, also does. Uh, Informix and Firebird does. Uh, Microsoft, not so much, it's an option. Uh, so again, kind of a, there is, this is actually a very uh, common now uh, internal capability of databases. Wasn't common, obviously, in the 90s when I started with databases, but uh, in the past five, 10 years, it's really kind of taken the system by storm. And I, today, am going to be talking about how Postgres actually implements that. Okay, any questions before we move on? Great, okay, this is, I think, one of the key slides of the whole presentation. Um, what it's showing you is uh, the internal representation of MVCC for Postgres. Uh, basically, you see three types of commands there, uh, insert, delete, and update. I have uh, actually put them in that order for a reason, okay? Let's look at insert. Insert basically, obviously, adds a row to the database. You'll notice that there are actually two internal fields inside the row that we've added. That pink block basically represents a new row. Um, one is the creation transaction ID. In this case, transaction 40 has created this row. And then um, we, this row has not been expired yet, so it's an active row, basically. So that's an insert. Uh, delete is similar, uh, basically has the same pattern. You have a creation transaction ID. But effectively, deleting a row merely means that you've put a transaction ID into that expired field, all right? Um, so again, when you think of somebody sort of deleting a row or erasing it from the system, doesn't really work that way so much in MVCC. You basically mark it as deleted and then you move on and then later on Postgres is gonna come and clean that up. But that row has to remain around so that we can, we can honor the promise that we've made that readers don't block writers and writers don't block readers. And I'm gonna show actually how that works in this particular case, 
Okay. Third example is really a combination. Uh, the update case is basically an insert. I'm sorry, a delete followed by an insert. And you can see I've actually even uh, marked them that way. So when you update a row in an MVC system, at least in a Postgres MVC system, what you're doing is you're deleting the old version of the row and you're creating a new version of the row, hence the name multi-version concurrency control. Yes, sir. So the question is, is the new row created right next to the old one? Um, Postgres will try and create the new row in the same page as the old row. There are some optimizations that we can do if the new and old row exist in the same page. If we cannot fit in the same page, we will spill over to another page. We will lose the ability to do some of the optimizations, but we will continue running just fine. Okay, good question. So basically we can replay this in, a, in an update case. We're deleting this version of the row with 78. And then we're creating a new row also with transaction 78, but this time the, the transaction number is the creation. The fact that these two numbers are the same is, is requ a requirement of an MVCC system because we've basically added this, we've, we've expired with one transaction, then created it with another transaction. Okay, and that kind of links them together in terms of that's an update to, to Postgres. All right? I'm going to show you some specific examples. Obviously, this is just a diagram. All right. Um, another term, and I'm not going to read all this text, is the idea of an MVCC snapshot. I'm not sure how many of you have heard the term snapshot before. We use it all the time in Postgres, actually. Um, it basically represents a, a view, a, a, a set of rules that define your view of the database. So if I'm in a specific session and I have a snapshot that I'm working with, that defines what rows I can see in that snapshot. If somebody else is running a different snapshot, they might, they are looking at the same database, but they get a different view, perhaps, of the data than I would. And that's what they, we mean by the term snapshot. Um, again, not very relevant prior to MVCC, because it, before MVCC, there was no really concept of snapshot, there, at least not the same power that we have now. Um, this snapshot idea basically gives you the ability, gives different people the idea, ability to see different things at the same time in the same database. And that's part of the way, again, that MVCC system works. Um, one example um, uh, that, that might be practical, how many of you have heard of uh, serializable isolation level or transaction isolation levels? Okay. Um, when you are running in the default transaction isolation level for Postgres is recommitted, you're getting a new snapshot every time you uh, run a new statement in a multi-statement transaction. Um, if you're running serializable mode, which actually is a, a more powerful way of doing uh, transactions, you actually, you actually keep the same snapshot through your entire multi-statement transaction. Okay? And what that effectively means is you don't see any changes in the data. The database looks static to you as you're running through this multi-statement transaction. Again, that's not the default mode for some reasons I won't go into, but again, it, it is a user visible kind of concept that if you've ever seen serializable or understand what it means to take a new snapshot every time you get a new command, that's effectively what you're doing here. And when you take that new snapshot, you basically are seeing new committed transactions that happened while one of your statements was running, even though you're in a larger transaction. Again, not really germane to this, but it's kind of a, a concrete example I think people have seen before, if you've ever dealt with this before. Okay. So um, honestly, this is kind of the key, I think, in understanding a lot of this snapshot information. Um, what I basically produced here, and I'm, I'm sorry the colors are a little weak. Um, I, I, I did my best, but the projector is a little, a little finicky, but I think you can kind of see it. You notice that these are bold right here. Okay, and these are much lighter. Can you see that? So they're, they're different colors, okay? Um, and what I'm showing you here is really, I think, the fundamentals of the MVCC system. Um, the idea is that we have six individual data rows in the system, but you will notice that some of them are visible and some of them are invisible, depending upon our snapshot that we have for this particular session, okay? And I'm going to walk through this with you real fast. Um, effectively, our snapshot here is defined 
as 100 being the highest committed transaction. So when we started our session, 100 was the highest committed transaction. And then we have transactions 25, 50, and 75, which are basically open transactions, meaning they're in process. So at the time we take our snapshot, which is, which is basically at the time we start our statement, we have highest transaction number 100, 25, 50, and 75 are currently executing. Okay? So if we, and we assume everything else is committed. So let's actually walk through this. And if you can kind of pull that together, I think we'll be in good shape. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one says, I've been created by transaction 30. I've not been expired. And that's a fairly easy one because transaction 30 is certainly a lot smaller than 100, which means it was, it was in the past. It was before 100 because it's 30, it's less, right? And also, um, it's not one of these running transactions, so it's done. And again, we assumed everything was committed, so it's a simple case. It's visible. We can see that row. The next one's a little different. This one was created by transaction 50. Now, 50 is less than 100, so we're good there. But 50 is one of those running transactions that is still going at the time we took our snapshot. Now, even if it commits later, it doesn't matter, because we have to give the user a consistent view. And therefore, we take the, we take the snapshot at the time we start our statement, and we never change it as we go. Okay. So in this case, this row is not visible, because he didn't commit at the time we took our snapshot. All right. This third one, 110, that one's not visible, because it's, uh, it's higher than 100, meaning it, ha it started after my transaction started. It started after my snapshot, so therefore I certainly can't see it because it, this is something that happened in the future relative to the time I took my snapshot. Again, we don't guarantee that you're going you're to get up-to-date information in Postgres. We give you consistent information. We give you information that's consistent at a point in time. If somebody's changing the database while your statement's running, you don't want to, believe me, you don't want to see those changes. Um, it would be something called a dirty read or so, if you're familiar with those things. Um, they will all, they will, that will cause you havoc if you actually saw all those things going on while you were trying to sum up something or lock something or whatever. Um, again, there are some, some, some sophisticated things we do if you were trying to update that row, but again, in general, you want to see a consistent view, and that's what that snapshot system does. Now, looking down here, you'll notice the difference is these all have expire values. Okay. So if we look at this one, again, tr created with transaction 30, which is good, but it also is expired by transaction 80, and that's also good or bad, meaning that it's expired. We can't see that row because it's been deleted by us. According to our snapshot, that row is deleted and we can't see it. Okay. Um, on the flip side, this one has been created by the same transaction, expired tr by transaction 75, but transaction 75 isn't done. It was running at the time we took our snapshot. Therefore, the delete doesn't really apply. Therefore, this row, I can see. Same thing down here, 110, deleted by a future transaction, a transaction that started after I took my snapshot. Again, I can't see, I can't see that delete. Therefore, I can see the insert. And therefore, that row is visible to me. Any questions? Yes. So the question is, when did the expired ones get cleaned up? The third part of the session actually talks about the cleanup process. Um, there's, there's basically a couple fundamental ways that these rows get cleaned up. And the, 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 the major aspect is that they don't get cleaned up at delete time. They get cleaned up when no one else cares about them. Um, and that's really one of the MVCC kind of things that we do for the user. We kind of keep around some old data to allow existing snapshots to all have a consistent view of the database. Other questions? OK. So um, confused yet? Yes, probably. Uh, this is actually a uh, source code comment from one of the Berkeley uh, developers. It actually happens to be uh, Mike Olson, who was the, the, one of the guys from Berkeley DB, uh, if you ever met him. And he, um, this is actually a, a comment explaining how the system works. And he basically says, the tests in this routine are correct. If you think they're not, you're wrong. And you should think about it again. I know it happened to me. Um, so, so there is a, a, quite a bit of sort of mind uh, stretching you have to do 
to really think about this and kind of kind of get in your head what's going on. I, can, I can't see that. I can see it. it. It is really complicated. OK? So let's talk about implementation details. We're now in the second part. We're done with the introduction. Uh, what I'm actually going to show you is effectively, I'm going to show you the system running. I'm going to show you running queries, and I'm going to show you MVCC as it actually looks in Postgres. This is, in, this is using an unmodified version of Postgres. I did install one or two little contrib modules. But in, in general, this is all stock Postgres. Um, basically, I create a little, uh, a little demo table that we're going to use for this session. And I also create a special view that, again, uh, relies on one of those contrib modules. Uh, we'll see this used a little later. Uh, I mentioned this is stock Postgres. So th that URL uh, basically has the SQL code that I'm going to be running for this session. So if you ever want to run and see this presentation live, you download the SQL file, you install page inspect, you run it, and you will basically see it. In fact, when I wrote this presentation, I wrote the SQL. This is, I have a couple presentations where I basically write the SQL, I run it, I capture it, I put it into an editor, and then I write a presentation around that. Um, it saves me a lot of typing, uh, makes sure it all works, uh, but again, it gives it a sort of a grounding so that we're, you know, I'm, I'm actually showing you, I'm not making anything up, this is exactly what it would look like. Um, second thing, uh, procedural, I ha there is a lot of text on this screen. Um, I've highlighted a bunch of stuff in red. So if you're looking at a presentation, if you're looking at a query, and you're like, what should I be looking at? Look at the red, right? Uh, that's really where you want to look uh, because it's actually showing you uh, the important part of that particular query. In this case, the red area actually represents um, a creation transaction ID. Remember I mentioned there was creation and expire. Well, you know, we don't call them creation and expire in Postgres. We call them xmin. X max. I don't know why they call them that. I, I guess I kind of know why. It's trans, X means transaction. I don't know why X and trans go together, but they always do. Um, and then the X min is the minimum. Cre, minimum is creation, and for some reason max is expire to them. So uh, effectively, what I do is I delete all the rows in the table. I insert one row, and I select two fields that are in every every row, but you don't normally see them. Uh, if you try and create an xmin or xmax column in your table, you'll get an error. And the reason you'll get an error is because these invisible columns are in every row. Um, and these invisible columns basically represent these fields right here. So this is xmin, this is xmax. This is xmin, this is xmax. OK? So just kind of make that transition there. So uh, what we're doing is we're basically inserting a row, and then we're looking at the row, which happens to be a 1. It's the same value. But we're now looking at the creation transaction ID for that row, which happens to be 5409. OK? So, so far, I'm not making it up. Um, that's indicating who created that row. All right? What if I do a delete? Well, OK, I'm going to insert a row. And I'm going to actually do a select. And I'm going to see the transaction creation right here. Then I'm going to start what we call a multi-statement transaction. I'm going to delete the row. And then from another session, you know how this is sort of indented? So I basically indented this little section here, OK? And I'm running this in another, another session, and I'm actually doing the select. Now, if I do the select in the same session, there's no row because I deleted it. My snapshot says I can't see that row, all right? My snapshot in my current session says I can't see that row because I deleted it in my own session. However, if I start a new session and I run a query, and again, I remember I talked about the fact that with MVCC, different snapshots show different values or different, give a different view of the database depending on your snapshot. In this case, this, tra this outer transaction has not committed yet to this running session. Remember I told you, that, remember this example here where um, we had 110, and this, this actually was visible because this was, this was not committed yet, or actually it was this one, I think, which isn't committed, it's still running, so we don't honor the delete. Well, it's the same thing here. Um, we're basically uh, haven't deleted it yet, so this row is still, here's my creation, here's my delete. And then actually I can confirm, if I run this statement, that in fact the transaction ID for this outer transaction is indeed 5412. Okay. Once I commit the transaction, 
then there's actually no row anymore and it goes away and everyone sees it as deleted. Okay? Um, but again, while it's running, other sessions wouldn't see the delete yet. How does it, yeah, I'm sorry. Are there ever times where it's useful to use those X min and X max values when working with the database? So the question is, is there any ever cases where it's va useful to use the X min, X max when you're working with a data database? Um, I would probably say no. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I have not, there really is no functionality that would be available by doing it that you couldn't do in a more sta SQL standard way, would be my answer. I, I've never heard of one. <laughs> so uh, let's take a look at update. Now remember I said, um, I mentioned that update is an, a delete followed by an insert, remember that? Um, so if I look at update, I basically insert a row, uh, there's the row right there, I begin a multi-statement transaction, I then update the row from one to two, okay? And if I look in my current session, I see two, but if I look in another session running at the same time, I see a one. And again, this is a classic example of snapshots showing different values for the same database from different sessions. Um, here you can see, here's the creation, here's the expire, and here's the same transaction ID, again, being used for the creation. Exactly what this slide is showing us right here. Okay, any questions? Still everyone's here, that's good. Okay, so what if I abort a transaction? So uh, insert a row, begin, delete the row, and I roll it back. So I've, I've committed the transaction, I roll it back. Uh, what, what happens to that? What happens to the delete? Okay, because remember the insert was committed, but the delete got rolled back. In fact, it looks like this. It turns out that even though that X max is there, the system actually has a, uh, a, a, set, uh, a file called PG underscore C log. I don't know how many of you have seen that before. It's in the data directory and it contains two bits for every transaction. And it basically represents whether that transaction is in progress, aborted, or committed. Okay, so in this case, when I rolled back this transaction, 5416 was marked with an 01. And anybody looking at that row will look at that number, we'll look at the C log, we'll see that that particular transaction was not committed, but in fact aborted, and we'll ignore the X max in that field. Now there are some optimizations that reduce the number of C log lookups in the future, but in general, that's how the process works. Okay, so that 5416 is never erased. We don't have to erase it. We don't have to go back and undo anything when we delete anything. All we do is just mark as deleted in that one, those two bits, and we're done. Yes, sir. What if two transactions try and delete the same row? Well, um, as I said, readers never block writers and writers never block readers, but I didn't say writers don't block writers. So they, they're going to block. Yeah, the first person is going to wait for the second person to come along, and he's going to wait to see if that transaction commits or aborts, and then depending on whether it commits or aborts, it will then continue with this transaction. So, so the question is, if you see an X max that's in flight, do you stop and wait? Yes. You would, you would, basically, you would basically look at this, if you were going to update that row, you would look here, it would show as in progress, and effectively, I have another locking talk that I'm obviously not giving here, um, but effectively what happens is that the session that's waiting for that to complete is going to go to sleep on the lock that that transaction holds, and then as soon as that transaction either completes or commits or aborts, that lock on that virtual transaction ID is going to go away, and that transaction will automatically be woken up, and it will now then recheck the row to see if it committed or aborted, and then go either way. Okay, if the system was to crash while it's locked, the system will come up, replay the right ahead log will basically um, mark all of, this, of these transactions that were in progress as aborted, 
and it's part of the replay. And then when that session comes along, it will basically know that this is a border transaction and then just run right away because there's nobody holding that block anymore. As you can see, it's quite a bit there, you know, that sort of keeps it going. Um, we also use uh, this XMAX field for row locks. I know that's sort of like adding, you know, piling complexity on complexity, but we had to do it that way. So, for example, if you do a uh, select for update related to, a little bit related to what you talked about, select for update, um, and I do, I actually look at the row, uh, you can't see anything, but if I go, if I look now after I've done the select, uh, it's kind of weird because the select for update doesn't show the X max, but the next run of the same select does. And I, I'm not sure why. I guess it's the way we did the logic is we bring the rows and then we lock them. I guess that's how we did it. So as you can actually see, that's a, that's a 5417. That happens to be my transaction ID. But that's not really an expire. See, that's a little hard. Um, there's, a, there's an invisible field that we set on the row which says, you know, you see that X max there? That really isn't a delete. That's really a row lock. Um, and therefore, like, you're going to have to go to sleep if you want to change it. Um, again, it was, it was done that way because we had limited space in the row. And it, it, you can't lock a row and delete it at the same time, or not normally anyway. Um, so we, we basically sort of overrode that field with, uh, with, with that, with that, uh, with that. We overrode the XMAX field to allow for row locks technically exclusive row locks share for update locks. For share locks actually has their own separate table, which uh, actually allows us to store multiple, because you can, sh multiple transactions can share lock a row, and you obviously can't shoehorn it into one field, so. Uh, but that was implemented like five years ago. Okay, uh, again, yeah, this is actually the internal uh, field that represents the, the that we throw on the row to say, you know that X max, it's not really a delete, so don't treat it that way. Okay, multi-statement transactions. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, um, but I'm gonna kind of give you a flavor of, of, of how we handle some of the complexities for multi-statement transactions. Uh, we basically have two fields called CMIN and CMAX, and they allow us to do multi-statement work, and I'm gonna show you some examples. So here I have an example. If I insert three rows into the database, one, two, three, okay? Uh, if I actually look at those rows, and I look at the CMIN field, you can see that I have no, I have no X max, so I didn't delete them, but I have the CMIN, and the CMIN allows me to sort of separate out the rows that were added by one statement in a multi-transaction from rows added from another Back query in the same multi-statement transaction. Why is that important? Well, if I have a multi-statement transaction and I'm doing insert, 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 um, or I'm doing an update, let's say, so I have, I'm doing insert, insert, and then I'm doing an update, I don't, I wanna make sure as I process those rows that I don't see any of the rows that I myself have already updated. There's some recursion possibilities that would really mess you up. So effectively we have this sort of third field called CMIN, which allows us to kind of identify, you know, that was done by the third, in this case it starts at zero, so the third statement of that transaction. All right? Um, same thing if I do deletes, insert, insert, insert. Um, you can see here's my one, two, three. Uh, it's a little more tricky. I have to declare a cursor to make this work. Um, but effectively, if I do a delete on all the rows and I look at my cursor, I can actually see who did the deletes for that particular, um, particular case. So here I'm doing, let's see, here I'm doing, did I delete? And yeah, this is a little, this is a little awkward to understand because again, I'm, I'm deleting and inserting in the same transaction. Um, there actually isn't a CMAX field, it's CMIN and CMAX kind of combined together, so it, it, it's really kind of awkward, but again, I'm just giving you a highlight of sort of what's going on there. There is another field out there that we use. Um, updates using CMIN here, insert one, two, three. There's the traditional output. I declare a cursor so I can see my data. If I s multiply them all by 10, you can see I've gone, uh, in this current session, I'm done 
10, 20, 30, and they've all been done by the fourth, starting at zero. So the fourth statement of this transaction has, has basically created all these rows. And the old rows were created by one, two, and three of that transaction. You get kind of idea there how that, how that sort of flagged and stuff as we go. Uh, modifying rows from this transaction, this is just sort of throwing some stuff out. So if I insert in this transaction, and then I add three more rows in another transaction, and I actually look, you can actually see here, this is getting a little more complicated. I'm showing you a mix of rows from different transactions now. Okay? I'm showing you this row, which was created by 5424, and then I'm showing you three more rows, which were created by 5425, and again, 0, 1, and 2, or 1, 2, 3 of that particular multi-statement transaction. And then if I multiply them by 10, um, I can see that we now have 10 to 40, and they've all been done by the fourth one. And then um, you can go to another session. And this is a little awkward. I only see one row out here. And why is that? Anyone want to tell me? Why do I only see one row? I'm sorry? Thank you. Uh, so he, what he's saying is that I have not committed the transaction that inserted 234. Because that's still running. This one got committed, right, completely. But th remember, this is only going to see committed data. And this tr outer transaction is still the one who inserted 234. Therefore, I don't see 234 there. Again, I threw this example in there just to sort of throw you a curveball and say, you know, there aren't. <laughs> There's, there's more than one transaction in a table usually, right? Um, so you start to see it can get pretty complicated. The good news is this all works. You don't have to debug it. You just use it. Um, there is something called a combo command ID. I'm not going to go over that a huge amount. Um, effectively, there, were, there are cases where if you create and delete a row in the same multi-statement transaction, there's no way to put both creation and deletion command counters, we call them, in the same field. Because xcmin and cmax are effectively a single field on disk, even though we call them two different names. Um, so effectively, what happens in this case, and again, we're getting a little more sophisticated, is that I basically have, in the same transaction, okay, I basically have created three rows but I've also deleted them in the same multi statement transaction, and we have a, a combo command ID that we use um, to basically, mul it's called multi exact, that we actually allow us to, to put two command IDs um, in the same field. Uh, and again, it's one of those sort of flags that we throw on the row and say, hey, this is a special phantom ID, and go look somewhere else to look it up. Okay? So, in summary, xmin, xmax, cmin, cmax, xmin, creation, done by insert update, xmax, uh, expire, done by update and delete, and then cmin and cmax, which are used mostly for your cases where you've got, you know, command counters, multi-statement transactions. Any questions? Yes, sir. So when I talk about a tuple, am I talking about a row? Um, that is a good question. Um, a tuple is basically a relational algebra concept. Um, we ha a, a tuple and a row are effectively the same in common English usage. We have a tendency to talk about a tuple more when we're talking about physical representation on disk. Because, for example, a physical row that a user might see might have two tuples or four tuples, depending on different, thank you, because of the different states that you have, that row may be represented by multiple physical tuples on disk, and, and different snapshots will see different tuples as the same row. Kind of, yeah. Question here. Yes, sir. Okay, so why am I using begin work and commit work instead of normal begin? Um, that's actually because begin work, I believe, is more SQL standard than begin. Uh, begin is a Postgres-ism. Um, 
in fact, I believe the way the standard normally wants you to do it is to say start transaction and commit transaction, but that's, those are really long. So I ended up <laughs> shorten it a little bit to make, say, begin work and, and commit. Um, but, but yeah, the, the SQL standard even wants more verbose words in some cases. Oh, I, I've mixed them up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, this. Um, so this is yes. Just as the delete has this output, the the, the begin work has begin, and it, it's it's. You're right. We guess we should say begin work, but we just say begin as an output. Thank you. So the question was really yeah, the output thing is yeah. Other questions. Okay. So now we're going to get into cleanup, which was your question, right? And again, a little more practical, I think, for people who are using Postgres. So. Obviously, you've got this case where you're now generating extra rows, right? I mean, particularly the update case, you're generating a new row for an update. Now, that's normally not done in databases. Normally, you replace the row in place. But when you replace the row in place, all of a sudden, you cannot take advantage of the sort of plethora of, 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 of goodness that MVCC gives you. So therefore, we have to create that new row. Uh, but we got to clean it up. So how do we do that, right? Well, um, the bottom line is the Postgres would have to do cleanup anyway. Even if, if it weren't for MVCC, you still got to clean stuff up. And I, I think every database calls it something different, but they all got to do cleanup somehow. Okay. For example, if you delete a row, well, we got to we got to reuse that space somehow, right? So we got to clean it up somehow. Um, also, if you board a transaction, again there's going to be some ramification to clean up, right? Um, MVCC just adds some additional ones. Uh, so it's adding uh, the need to clean up these updated rows, and also um, it, it can delay the cleanup a little bit. We can't clean it up at the time we delete it because there might be some snapshot that needs it. So all of a sudden, a lot of the cleanup has to happen asynchronously in other sessions. Okay, and Postgres has gotten really good at this. We weren't very good 10 years ago, but now we're really good. So again, most of these things don't affect you, but you should know probably what they do. So how do we do it? Two, two ways. First way is something called an on-demand cleanup of a single page. Remember somebody asked me, they said, uh, do you always put the update like near the old row? Remember that was you, I think, right? So actually, that's actually part of how we do this on-demand, this one single page cleanup. There are some optimizations we can do if the update is on the same page that we can't do if the update's on a different page. Okay? Um, and then we also have this bulk cleanup that is basically something called auto-vacuum that basically runs through the database and kind of just cleans up everything and remembers where all the free space is and then allows you to reuse it. Okay? And I'm going to go into detail about each of these. So uh, aspects of cleanups. There's three things we can clean up. We can clean up the, uh, the data, okay, that we, we call the, the heap tuples or the rows. Then we can also clean up something called item pointers and then index entries. And each of those have a different method of cleanup. Now uh, that might be kind of abstract for you, so I've provided a slide, right? Uh, basically, this is a heap page. All of our heap pages happen to be 8K in size. Okay, and as you can see up at the top, they have item pointers, um, and these item pointers basically uh, point to data rows or tuples. Okay, again, as I said, we have a tendency to use tuple when we're talking about on-disk storage. What about item pointers? I mean, what about indexes? Well, one of the interesting things about Postgres, and again, this came from the Berkeley folks, um, is that the indexes themselves don't point to the rows. They don't point to the tuples. They point to the item pointers, and the item pointers point to the tuples. They may think, well, that's just stupid. Like, why do you do double indirection like that? Well, uh, what we can do is we can move rows around on this page without having to touch the indexes. Because as you may realize, index cleanup and index sort of wholesale is just really expensive, right? They're randomly spread all over. They're B tree or whatever. It's just hash. It's a mess. So the, le the, the, the more we can do without touching the indexes, the happier we are. Um, and that's why these indexes always point to the item pointers and not to the actual data rows. Okay, so let's, let's, let's get some concrete stuff here. So 
uh, what happens if tuple 1 and tuple 2 are no longer needed? We can expire those. When basically what we're saying is not only are they deleted, but no existing snapshot can see them. And that's really the key. Not that they're deleted. The deleted just means, okay, they're going to be removed eventually. But we have to also know that nobody wants to see them. And as long as we know nobody wants to see them, meaning nobody has a snapshot that can see them, we can then recycle that space. And because the index doesn't point to the rows, we can basically just get rid of them. And we don't have to do that in any fancy way. We can just, as we're looking at the page, we're like, hey, did you see those rows? There are no, nobody sees those anymore. Let's just get rid of them, right? And then with an insert or somebody wants to update on that page, we now have from some free space available. So uh, effectively what happens is we can mark the item pointers as dead, and then we can just recycle the space on the spot. That's part of that sort of single page cleanup I talked about. You get to move tuple three while you do it, right. So tuple three, you, item pointer used to, well, item pointer three used to point to tuple three. Now item pointer three points to tuple three, but now in a different spot. The index doesn't know because it's only pointing at the item pointer. And these are basically marked as dead and they just put a little flag in their tiny little fields. And we just basically say, you know this item pointer? Don't go there, there's nothing there, right? It's done. So the tuples variable size that they contain all the data. They normally contain all the data, although there is a toast system which will handle values over about 2K in length. Because again, the page is only 8K, so we can't get, let our rows get too big. So we basically have this toast system where we'll take any of the longer values and we'll push them off somewhere else. There's a whole lot of advantages to that. I do have some blog entries about it. Um, I'm not gonna go into it here, but effectively it gives this kind of a, a storage system where we have all the short values kind of together and then long images or long documents are now stored in these backup tables. That happens automatically. You don't do anything to have that happen. Okay? So the, the point was, right, if you have a four, by, four character field, it's, it's gonna be in line, it's gonna be in the heap. If you have a whole essay, the system's automatically going to trigger, it's going to put a pointer here, and then it's going to put the data out, out in this longer text, this longer heap, this longer toast area. And then when you're sequential scanning it, unless you're interested in that long field, you won't see it. You'll just kind of hop over it, right? Um, and I have written some blog entries about it. Like, for example, don't do select star unless you want all the fields. Like, people don't think about that. Well, I'll just do select star. Well, yeah, except if it's, there's some long fields in there, you're now accessing the toast table. If you don't want that value, don't ask for it because that can be quite expensive for long fields. So it's, it's, it's actually so transparent that people don't think about it. I mean, you have to sort of say, uh, you know, it's, I know it's transparent, but uh, can, you, can, you not, uh, can you not do that to me, right? I'm sorry? So if the select star was inside a subquery, would that get optimized away? Um, yeah, nobody really does select star inside a subquery. Um, it, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I can't remember how we do that. I don't think it would, yeah. Something to keep in mind, yeah. Okay, so um, we also have that vacuum process I mentioned. It runs automatically, um, and it would allow us to then clean out the indexes. And again, cleaning the index is sort of a wholesale process that we do, um, and it would then allow us to clean out the indexes, and then we can mark these item pointers as unused, and then reuse them uh, for you know for um, for other data that's coming in. Okay, so you can see it's kind of a tiered thing. We're clearing out the data, which is the most, the biggest. Then we kind of hit the item pointers and then the index is kind of in a wholesale manner. Okay. Um, here's an example. Here I truncate the table. I kind of fill it up so it's like less than 10% full, less than 10% empty. And then I basically, uh, it's fact it's 6% uh, empty. 
and I insert one more row, and then I can kind of see the row. And if I delete the row and I add a two, so I delete the one, I add a two, you can see here's the item pointer for the first row, and you can see it's deleted. And here's the item pointer for the second row. And if I actually delete the two and insert a three, you can actually see that first row is now marked as dead, meaning that the data is gone, but the item pointer is still there. Okay, um, and here's two, which will be get rid of. There's three, um, and then if I do a select again, just a select. I'm not even updating the table. Just do a select. You can see I've now marked both of these as dead. So the system, even in a select, if it's looking at the row and it's done the lookup information, it'll basically say, okay. I'm now identifying these two guys are dead. Let's get rid of them, OK? Um, and and that, that's actually what it would, would look like. And then uh, if I then run a vacuum, you can see that they're now marked as unused, OK? So again, that's part of that cleanup process that we have. And again, it would look like that. Uh, we, all, we have something called a free space map. It's basically a place that Postgres uh, stores uh, how much free space you have in your table. So for example, if you've got you know, 100 blocks in your table and you want to do an insert, well, where do you put it? The table's got 100 blocks. Which block do you put it in? You look at the free space map. Free space map says, hey, uh, page number 12 has a lot of free space. Go there. So uh, what that vacuum effectively is doing is it's not only clearing out that data, but it's recording where the free space is so that other sessions can reference it very quickly and then reuse the space efficiently. All right. Uh, here's an example. I truncate the table. I vacuum it. Um, in fact, you can see it actually, if there's no data in the table, the, the vacuum will actually shrink the table too. But the data has to be, it has to be in a whole empty page. And it has to be at the end of the table. It'll just go. Uh, we, have to, we have a vacuum full, which will actually rewrite the table. But again, that's not something that's going to lock the table, not something you're going to do in normal usage. Um, another free space map example here, uh, fill up the table, insert a one, insert a two. You can see actually the free space going down, and then it's back up again once I've deleted the row. Again, sort of like you can kind of see the free space getting bigger and smaller. Um, again, if you've got empty pages at the end of the table, we'll just truncate it. So here we actually deleted it. Um, here we select free space map, it's nothing there, and you can see it's just shrunk the table. And again, vacuum full will we'll rewrite the whole table. Uh, questions? Good. OK. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's basically um, you, you store. Uh, so the question is, um, are these pages on disk? Are they in RAM? Or you know, how do they get there? So effectively, uh, you have. You know, your data directory, which has all the physical pages. And then um, as you need them, they'll be loaded into an area called shared buffers. And then we'll do all of our reading, writing, locking in that shared buffer area. And then asynchronously, that will be written back down to the storage. We also have a write-ahead log, which will record all the changes and get committed to disk. And often, that will happen before we actually write the physical page back to disk. So you're almost doing a double double write in a way. And that's traditionally the way that databases have dealt with that kind of problem. So, so the question is, that sounds a lot like the way the kernel does what it's doing. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Yeah. So this is a journal. It's, it's very similar to a journaling file system. Right, right. Yeah. So would it, would it say, would it be better performance somehow if you use a, a raw buffer rate on yeah, so the question is, would it be better to use a raw block device? In fact, uh, the Postgres documentation recommends that you mount your, your journaling file system volumes with um, data equal write back, which minimizes the amount of journaling that happens in those file systems, because effectively, because of the write ahead log, you're, you'd be double journaling. Um, and you're going to see maybe a 3% win by mounting them with a lower overhead journaling option for file systems that you use for Postgres. Yep. OK. So uh, we're almost, well, we're kind of done. Not almost done. Um, single page cleanup, I talked about how that works. There is a little bit more to this. And it really relates to the question about having updates on the same row. 
Okay, so here we have a, um, a, a row, the one data row and an index pointing to it. Okay, if we then do an update, okay, remember I said there can be multiple versions of the rows, so I basically create a new version of the row. And um, what you're going to notice here is I've got a pointer on the row which points from the version, first version to second version. But what's the real key is that there's only one index pointer here. This is what we call a heap only tuple, uh, feature added, I believe, in Postgres 8.3, um, which basically allows us to do updates without bloating the index or without adding additional index entries. And it actually improves our cleanup pot potential uh, pretty much. For example, when I get to version 3 of the data, I effectively have removed version 1 on my own. And I can repoint the item pointer over here. Remember, one of the things that really limits our recycling are these item pointers. So if we can chain the item pointers in the heap page and only have one item pointer, it allows us to recycle much more aggressively because we don't need to go to the index to clean anything up. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, first item pointer is no longer pointing to data, but is now pointing to two. 2 is pointing to 2, 2, 3 is pointing to 3. Um, at version 4, version item pointer 1, which is still the one the index knows about, is now pointing to 3. And version 3 is now pointing to version 4, which happens to be on item pointer 2 now. All right. Again, because those, item, because those indexes are not locking us into, uh, into reusing these item pointers, we can be fairly aggressive. So um, just to think that I'm making this up, um, Basically, when you get to version 4 and it knows that there's no more versions visible, it'll actually just mark this as unused. It'll redirect number 1 to number 2, and then we're done. Okay. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Here's an example. I'm kind of filling up the page. Um, here's one data row that's uh, basically deleted. Here's a second data row. If I do an update again, and this is, this is literally what it will show you. In the, in the output. So it basically says item pointer 1 or 241 is now pointing to 2, and 2 is really dead but points to 3, then, uh, which is basically this case. Um, when we then do an update again, now 1 points to 3, which happens to be deleted, which points to 2, and then, uh, which is this case. And then finally, uh, if we just do a select, uh, just to look at the rows, you can see now 1 points to 2. 2 is now our normal pointer, and 3 has been recycled. So thank you. So what you can see here is basically that we've gotten much better. If we can keep the update on the same page, we get much better at recycling these things hot. So the classic example of Postgres would not be good in the past. We've got a counter. One row, a counter, just goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That used to be terrible with Postgres because effectively we couldn't get that vacuum in there fast enough to recycle them. Now the system's like, oh, well, as soon as I can get rid of these, every time I go to update a row, I'm going to recycle that row and I'm going to make sure that that counter, uh, that that row doesn't get bloated up. Okay? Um, it's effectively what's, what's, what's going on here. That's the cleanup. Uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. So um, we can run vacuum. That actually allows us to do some pretty cool stuff. So here we've got a bunch of uh, sort of deleted rows. I run vacuum, and again, it just gets rid of all of them. So vacuum still has the cool stuff, but one, one thing that we can't do is if you, have, if you update indexed columns, we can't do this recycling. Because remember, we can't share. Let me get a slide here. Nope, sorry. So the problem is if you, um, if you update an index column, we can't have the same index pointer pointing because we need a separate index for the new value, right? So um, the problem, what we're actually showing you here um, is that if you create an index and you're all updating the index, what you're going to notice is this kind of pattern. You've got a dead one, two normal. I have two dead ones. I have three dead ones. I can still update, I can still delete the data rows, but the pointers are going to stay around because I've now got indexes pointing to them. Okay. Finally, when we do vacuum, those can be, those can be cleared out. So you guys, you can see Postgres is fairly aggressive in its ability to clean stuff out. Um, it's now a very mature, robust system. Works really well. 
Um, we didn't, when we, before we had a lot of these features, there were uh, some pathological cases, uh, but I don't think Postgres handled well at all. Um, at this point, it's really something you don't really need to worry about. Uh, single page vacuums are very effective. Uh, deleting um, the, the vacuum system itself is very efficient at knowing which pages are dirty and which pages aren't, uh, and I think that works really well. So we end with this slide, which I think is, is, is uh, very apropos to what we're doing here. Uh, it's an Escher relativity, and you can see, uh, I think, sort of talking about snapshots that, from your perspective, you see uh, different things, and each, each person thinks they are sort of seeing the right view of the data. <laughs> there is no one set of data, exactly. Well, thanks a lot. I'm undone. Um, again, I'll be talking tomorrow morning and on Sunday, and certainly I have that class on Monday. So I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I hope uh, if you have any questions, I'll be up here. But again, I'm out of time. Thanks. <laughs>
of the uh, you know of the community and and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You'll have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.